Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Low Code Cafe. This is episode number 132 for March 22nd, 2023. Today, we're going to talk about more fresh plant and app features in version 125. Uh, I am Dale Warner, head of support for Plant and App, and I'll be your guide today. Um, this event is one that we do uh, most Wednesdays. Actually, that's a schedule change announcement we're going to make today, but uh, alternating Wednesdays on uh, 10 a.m. this hour, uh, 10 a.m. Central Time. And uh, it's now a biweekly team and community webinar where we do, uh, talk about updates, demos, and uh, do hands-on coding. We uh, invite you to be our guest speaker if you uh, have a, a um, application or technique or um, use case that would be interesting to the community, we would be happy to host you. Um, so reach out to us on that or uh, to, uh, to our uh, emails uh, that are on the um, emails that we send to you. We publish all these on our YouTube channel. So we have 131 hours of good training content out on YouTube. Uh, youtube.com slash plant and app. Uh, today, and I, and I didn't update the agenda, we, we will be talking about uh, the product overall and the beta release, and uh, Peter Schottman will be joining us to talk about that. But uh, then I'll do a brief from the trenches segment, and then the most of our time today will be spent looking at the new features that are coming out with our version 1.25. So do engage with us, go to the, uh, use, you can use the chat window, the Q&A, you can raise your hand to speak and uh, look for the feedback form. It'll be on the links that we send to you. We'd be happy to, to uh, hear your thoughts about what we can do in upcoming webinars. So yes, there is a schedule change. The Low Code Cafe is going to a bi-weekly schedule. So our next live webinar will be April 5th. Uh, so do join us for that. I think the uh, the webinar has been updated to reflect that, but uh, we'll we'll uh, see you again in two weeks. So with that, if I could ask Peter to join, and um, we can talk about what we're doing from a big picture perspective in our version one twenty five that is about to come out. Hello, Peter. Yes, there I am. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, yes, I would like to talk about uh, 125 release. Uh, the release uh, has a number of uh, improvements in it. And when we talk about enterprise value, uh, what we started is uh, the .NET Core initiative. Uh, the idea is that we have, uh, that we are moving the product to .NET Core. Uh, and the idea is that uh, at the end of the year or something like that, we have a side-by-side -side version that runs on .NET Core and has multiple uh, microservices in it. Uh, at, at the same time, it still runs on uh, DNN, of course. So that will that initiative requires lots of development hours, of course, from the Plant and App organization and. Uh, we'll see a lot of code changes in there. So moving uh, stuff from uh, one uh, namespace to another to separate things that are platform specific from uh, things that uh, that you can develop on .NET standard. So there's a, there's a big initiative and that's the one we started uh, in, in January. And we hope to, uh, to get uh, a release out or uh, parts of the release out uh, somewhere in the summer. Uh, so that's uh, that's for us, that's a, that's a big thing. It requires also lots of thoughts and um, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of hands-on uh, work. Uh, the other thing we have, uh, have developed in this release is uh, a better version of the guides. Uh, in the product it's called Infobox. But we, uh, we want to call them guides so that you can start up a guide. Uh, for instance, there will be a guide in 125 for 
new users, which new users uh, can start. So if you start a product as, as a new user, you will get uh, a, um, a guide that will help you create entities and fill entities and stuff like that. So that is the, uh, the first starter guide uh, we, we developed. We will also in the future develop guides, for instance, for new features in the product that uh, just like you see uh, every now and then in your office uh, environment that, hey, there is something new. That is also what we want to do in uh, with guides. But for the moment, we have now a uh, the first version of the guides that helps people create, uh, yeah, create an entity and fill the entity tables and uh, and use the entity form. The third thing we uh, we are doing is uh, we are refactoring. So, as uh, some of you will know, uh, Plant and App will is based on uh, on the code which is uh, which used to be Dean and Sharp, and uh, there are lots of things that are in there uh, which we are. Uh, improving upon, for instance, the rendering engines for search boost and forms, especially search boost, we will move away from the uh, from the XSL uh, rendering engines, and for forms, we will do that in the future. So we're now preparing for, in the latter case, we pre be preparing for the move to the Razor-based engine. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, what we're improving in improving the product. Of course, we have a number of initiatives we are uh, doing uh, at least uh, uh, as of last summer. For instance, I, uh, API and automation, we are doing lots of things in there. And what we did in for this release, we improved our validation. We also now have change tracking in place so that if you move away from you, you, you did some work on a job and you, you click on, uh, for instance, APIs or whatever other link in the product, then you will get notified by the fact that there is uh, that you did a change which you did not save yet. So, and of course, we, we worked on uh, stability, uh, UX improvements, and lots of other small stuff. With respect to continu continuous improvements, uh, we have improved listings. Uh, listings uh, we use in the um, the BS3 era. Uh, there was the uh, the automatic change uh, when you uh, look at listings. Uh, the uh, the grids on a mobile device, you could uh, uh, have it moved from uh, a grid, uh, so a, a table a table based structure. Uh, uh, to a card-based structure, and that's we re-implemented that for the Bootstrap 5. So I think a lot of people will be happy with that. That it's uh, that has come back, and uh, we also had the grid the grid buttons uh, working better, so that if the data changes inside the listing for whatever reason, uh, for instance, if you push an item button, uh, the grid buttons uh, get uh, re-evaluated and either turned on or off or whatever. So in this release, we, we uh, I counted about 60 uh, improvements and fixes. So I hope you will like it. Uh, on the documentation side, we, uh, we have uh, done work in the area of forms and in the area of token examples. And of course, we also uh, uh, released the knowledge base which you can use. So that's, uh, that's about, uh, about it for this release. And if you want to participate in the beta, which we hope will start on Friday, uh, you can send a. Uh, if you do not have that, uh, you send uh, you can send a um, an email to support at plantonapp.com to uh, to ask for an invite. Beta program will uh, is also improved. So what we will have now, we have a new uh, beta procedure, and that will be explained in the mail uh, when you when we start the beta. So you can uh, you can now uh, up, upgrade existing tests environments and uh, uh, try out, of course, the uh, the new version in the clean environment. But it's it's always better to have a uh, a beta uh, upgrade on an existing environment, uh, so one of your test environments of the live site. So that was it for me, and uh, I hope you liked the new release. And if you have questions, uh, don't. Uh, uh, please ask them in the chat or in our community event on Friday. So then we can have in the on the campfire we have can have a discussion. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, before you jump away, we all we, we, we do have one question that happened on the, uh, on the chat, which is whether um, our new 125 is going to be compatible with the DNN 911. Um, from my testing, it's, uh, it seems to be compatible. Uh, we have not uh, officially released uh, the, um, the 125 on uh, the 911 one. So we have to uh, we have to negotiate that with development, uh, and and hopefully we can can do that before uh, the release gets out. Uh, what we see in the 9.11.1 release is that uh, that it's incompatible with uh, SQL Server uh, 2012. 2012 is indeed an old product, but still supported by uh, by DNN at least uh, in their documentation. Uh, so currently there's a, a an, uh, so if you are still on uh, SQL Server uh, 2012, uh, DNN will not work on 9.11.1, but there's a release candidate. Uh, I got that yesterday. I think yesterday uh, late that there is a release candidate for a 9.11.2 out that uh, that sort of uh, solves that problem. So. Um, we do not officially uh, support the 9.11.1 version, but I will assume that will happen in the very near future. And, and I think that's, I mean, thinking about that just in, in general terms, um, our, our goal is always to support the, the uh, latest and greatest. We always assume that, they're, that it's better and has more security features and things like that. But um, it, it always requires testing. And so uh, we, what, um, you know, our standpoint is that it's, it's an un, unsupported from us uh, until we, um, until we've had a chance to test against it. And uh, we, we had announced that on our uh, documentation pages, we have a, a um, compatibility page. So that's, that would be the place to look. The other way to know for certain of, uh, as well is that when we release, um, we, we provide the ability to automatically upgrade DNN platform as you're upgrading the product. And we will offer it when, uh, after we've made it, um, after we consider it to be compatible. So um, if, if you see it on the list, it's, uh, uh, it's known to be, uh, we've, we've done the testing, but um, we ask you not to get too far ahead of us or realize that uh, that you may encounter issues do it in a, in a test environment, certainly, but uh, don't get ahead of us on your production environments. Good. All right. Thank you. Then, uh, thank you, Peter. I'm going to move on to, uh, to our From the Trenches segment, which is going to be uh, quite brief today. Uh, the first of that is that on our previous version, and I guess our current version, 1.24, we have previously released 18 hotfixes, uh, and we are releasing two more, have released already two more this period. Um, and they both, they're really one fix, uh, that uh, API endpoints were not working uh, correctly when localization was enabled. So if you had multiple languages enabled on your system, and uh, this, uh, this, these set of fixes solve that. And so you should, if you're in that circumstance, you should install both of these hot fixes, one for API, uh, uh, for, one for app builder and one for DNN endpoint. So you'll see those on the list. Uh, again, we hot fixes, if they don't apply to you, there's, uh, you, you, you don't need to install them, but if you're in that circumstance and, and you're trying to get your API to work because you have a localization enabled, then you would install that. Um, and uh, again, to restate, our goal is that uh, all, uh, the, the plan is that every hotfix that we do gets incorporated into the next revision as well. So there's no need to individually install hotfixes. Uh, if you don't need them, they're going to be incorporated into the next version. Great. Uh, I put a reminder here, but didn't cross it out. Um, I'll just I'll just mention this that um, we've had over the uh, in both this meeting and in our campfire meeting 
uh, calls for the ability to resize or create thumbnails out of images. And uh, we do have a tool that does that. Uh, and I will be demonstrating it, uh, whether it's uh, in, in the next uh, low code cafe or maybe on campfire, but the, it's, um, uh, the, the thumbnail creator is an add-on that you can uh, add to the product. It's then an action that will let you um, uh, input, uh, take in an image and resize it in, in different dimensions with different options. We have compression options as well. So, um, uh, and, and since I've gone to the trouble of mentioning it, I'll also mention the, uh, there, is, there is an issue with it. And if you're anxious to use that, let's say do attend Campfire this week, we will uh, talk to you about the idea that um, it's asking for uh, a parameter that you need to feed it an absolute URL that um, uh, in, instead of a um, what what the inline documentation calls for. So a little bit of a documentation thing that we're trying to clean up. And if you're neat, if you want to use that before we get it cleaned up, uh, watch the uh, low code campfire this week and uh, we'll cover how to deal with that. Okay, and with that, engage in Campfire. Campfire is a, a weekly event. It will remain a weekly event every Friday, uh, this same hour, 10 a.m. Central Time. It is an event that is um, uh, more of a meeting format. So instead of us just presenting content, you'll uh, work with us to, uh, to talk about maybe what you have going on, issues that you're facing, uh, issues that uh, you'll hear about, issues that you're uh, fellow low coders are encountering and uh, perhaps get solutions even while you wait. Um, I'm going to put some links for this episode on the clipboard and I'll do that now. Uh, Patrick was not able to join us today, so let me. Well, I'm in do it yourself mode here, so let me drop these onto the clipboard. These are how you can register for low code campfire, how you can get to our YouTube channel. Uh, encourage you to engage in our community portal uh, because uh, you can ask questions there that are answered not only by the support team, but also your fellow low coders. And then that, that feedback form that I was talking about earlier. So um, please do engage with us on those. Um, so with that, let's go on to hands-on low coding and what features you're going to see in version 1.25. Um, I've got a number of them here that, that, uh, that we'll talk about. And interestingly, I managed to blow up my 125 demo system right before, uh, this, this webinar started. And so some of the things that I had prepared are gone. I started on, this is a, a blank, uh, um, 1.25 system. So we'll we'll uh, find our way through some of these things uh, in a real time here. So let's talk about the first one. Um, there has been a, a an issue that um, people have encountered, and so this is an enhancement. We're going to cover the good news first, right? The enhancements. Uh, if you have a root button in a listing, um, these were not previously being uh, re-evaluated when the data source got refreshed. So your data in your grid could change, your listing could change, and then the uh, the, the button wouldn't reflect that. And so uh, now it does. And so let's see if we can have an example of it, uh, of a before system, and we can, uh, real time, we can do a, uh, We can do it live on the 1.25. Of course, that system is not powered up, so it'll take just a second. And here we go. So um, on the system, uh, let me show you the setup. We have a book listing. And on it, we have fields like the ID, the name, and the date published. But um, I have a button, a root button, and it's defined as 
process the Dale records. This is a make believe button, but I'm, I only want it to show up when the number of Dale records in the system is not equal to zero. And uh, so what this would look like then is if we do an edit of this and it, the name of the book begins with Dale, we want the button to show up but the button isn't being reevaluated in this older version of the product. If I refresh the whole page, the button shows up. So the button is designed and it's working, but it just doesn't change based on uh, um, the, the records that are present as they're changing, it doesn't get reevaluated. So, um, it only gets done with the page load. Some people don't want to wait through the page load. That, that might be a big performance issue for your system. So that's that's fixed with this version. So let's walk through that. We go into the configuration of our system. I'm just going to build this from scratch. It might take about a couple of minutes. Ah, I have dependencies to install. So that is going to take a couple of minutes. And so we'll have to wait through that. Let's move on to some other things and we'll come back to that. Um, in the guides that um, Peter was talking about a little bit ago and that Patrick demonstrated a couple of weeks ago, we have added, we talked about this a little bit, but when you are in a guide, um, the various steps of a guide, the idea is that it's gonna pop up a bubble that's going to point to something on the screen and, and explain it. It's gonna guide you through the application. Um, Prior to this update, the all of those the the title of the bubble and the message inside the bubble uh, were static text, and now they support tokens. And so this gives us the ability to um, to have that be more dynamic, whether it brings in your user information or something from the command line or some kind of token from um, from the tokens area. It lets you. Uh, be dynamic in using that. So, uh, so that's one. Um, let's see where we are with this refresh, and it is in progress here. So we'll let that continue. What else can I talk about? We're going to be going through a number of the uh, enhancements in our new user, in, in new administrative interfaces that we've been working on in the last couple of releases. These are, uh, again, the story is they've started within automation. They've expanded out to the API. So you, when you're working with API endpoints, you have this new uh, look and feel and capabilities. And so we've made a number of enhancements in this, uh, in the area of these capabilities. It's not throughout our product yet, but that's the direction that we're going. So, for example, when you're in uh, in automation and defining a job or in APIs and defining an API endpoint, we now have the ability Control S as a shortcut to save your your current work. Um, this is a small thing, but it's the the um, uh, from a convenience factor. And I know there's people on our webinar that uh, that are cheering because. Uh, it, the way that we were set up previously and in previous versions to that, you would end up saving and having to close out. The only way to save your work was to, to leave and come back. So we've been moving towards being able to save in place and now we're, we've got control S to save your current work. So that's, um, that's a, a convenience thing. Uh, another one that I'll mention is that um, in our new interfaces, APIs, and, uh, both in APIs and the automation, when you open up those um, screens to work with them, it brings up all the names of the, um, either, let's say the, the jobs in automation or the APIs in, in the API endpoint, brings up all their names and methods. And um, through some, uh, we've made that more efficient. That's the short version. It's gonna be much better performance. Uh, it turns out that we were loading far too much information. We were bringing in all of the actions and data that were behind those to load those screens. And so it made it uh, take a long time to load and it didn't give us any great gain. So we've, uh, we've corrected that. And uh, this also is going to make it not only faster to load, but when you have uh, a larger system that has many jobs or many APIs, that it will uh, load and uh, not error. 
Okay, I'm gonna back up, go backwards now since our uh, since the system has reloaded, and so we're going to uh, go back to entities and define a book entity here and see how this uh, works well now. So we have our first entity, we're going to have some default namespace. So we're going to create an entity that's going to hold books, and we'll do just the name of the book. We don't really need to be complex here, and um, and we'll save that. So now we're going to have a page that will allow us to, to put in the name of books, and we'll do that. Put in a couple of books. Slowly. So we have books. Hmm. Here we start to see our guides. This is nice that it's loaded in and, and active. I'm just going to skip this so it doesn't interfere with what we're doing today. All right, so um, we'll do a new book. We'll do a couple. We have no books that begin with the, the name Dale. So we'll do, this is, this is, we're, we're going to do a token that we can evaluate just so we can prove out that this thing works. So I'm going to add a, a namespace, a token that's in the namespace of demo. And within that, I'm going to add a token that is um, Dale records definition of this is going to be a database query and actually I'm going to just save this and walk away and we'll do a little bit of testing. Uh, I like to demo to generate my SQL in the SQL console so we'll activate the SQL console. It can show up here on the left menu. And this helps us with our syntax. So we have app book, I can click that and copy it to the clipboard. So paste that now and we can see our books are returning the content. What I really wanna do is get how many books there are. And so we'll say the count of ID from book and so it's telling us, uh, and I'm going to give this a name. And this is giving us the, the total. We're going to add a where clause here where name is like. It should give us zero. Perfect. So we've got a working SQL statement that we can now use in a token. And so I'm going to. Uh, I didn't create that token. So we'll do this. Uh, the name of the token is the number of Dale records token and database query. And we'll do that select. And so this is this is just a nonsensical example, but it will return a good value. So we'll save and test this and it gives us a zero. There aren't any that way. But now we have a token. And so we can use this in our in our books listing. And we're going to go to the books listing. And add a button to process the Dale records. We only want it to show up if that is not equal to zero. And syntax that way. And I'm not even going to do any actions. I'm really just concerned about whether or not the button shows up. So this will be a, a minimal test. So we'll save this. And Refresh. Notice the button doesn't show up, but if we uh, 
edit a record, for example, and put that magic word in front of it. Now the button shows up. So this button gets evaluated um, every time the data source refreshes. And with that, you can do a number of things. So for example, anywhere where you can use tokens, you can do some dynamic evaluation. So this conditional get will get reevaluated if we wanted to, uh, for example, ask for uh, confirmation and you wanted to change the value, put a change the value of this message to something dynamic that would change. Um, so uh, just a nice feature to reevaluate tokens. Okay, so uh, much, much discussion about uh, a convenience feature, but I think it'll, I think it's a performance feature. All right, so let's do this. We, all, we also have, and as Peter mentioned, the ability to um, select data table or card view based on the device type. This is a, an enhancement that we put into place in Bootstrap 5. It was previously available in Bootstrap 3 in a different form, but here's how it, uh, here's what it looks like. When you have a view, you can have uh, this is the older Bootstrap 3 view here on Legacy, but these other ones are Bootstrap 5. And so if you turn on uh, data table and cards, uh, when you save that, it's going to give you a choice of how you're going to look at your view. And it also and, and the, the choice shows up here. So you can see it in card view. If you click that, it shows up in card view. And click that in, in um, listing view or data table view. By the way, um, you can change the, the default order of those. So the order of the buttons by sliding around the, um, the views settings. So uh, if you want um, data table to be the data table button to come first, you can do that. But within our settings for this, we now have the display target. So this for desktop, it's going to target data table view. For cards, it's going to target a mobile view. And you can you can change that data, data table or desktop to desktop or mobile. And so uh, when we save this now, depending on the device where we approach, where we view this. Uh, it's it will display differently. And I want to caution you that if you're familiar with the way that this has worked in the past, um, it was responsive. And so as you change the size of the window in a in a desktop browser, you could um, you could force it to switch into card view because it was narrow enough to be considered mobile mobile view. But now uh, we're we're doing more about sensing the device. It does it in a different way. So if you want to test this, you either have to, for example, you can um, do a QR code and bring up the page on your mobile device and see how it responds. Alternately, if you want to do it on the device, you can, uh, on, a, on a browser, you can use the uh, device toolbar to pick a different kind of device. So I'm going to act like I'm an iPhone here. And uh, so now I'm going to, refresh the screen and if i've set it up right it will go into card view and it did so because it's a a uh, mobile device type and i'm sorry that that's so small i don't know if i can make that bigger or not nope um but it um uh, if it senses the device is a mobile device and you have that feature enabled then you're going to see card view if we go to um, if we turn that off and go to normal, uh, it's the default view is going to be in the listing view. So a nice feature bring back uh, you know, brought forward into Bootstrap Five. Uh, so that's the uh, based on device type. Um, we had a, a small improvement um, editing the entities. Um, we, when, when you got into certain circumstances, narrow screens, uh, you didn't have a, um, a scroll bar at the bottom. 
And so uh, if we were to go to a narrower view um, and look at our properties page, for example, that um, previously as it got narrow, we had no scroll bar down here at the bottom and you couldn't get to the properties that were on the right. It's still better editing in a full screen or a wider screen mode, but at least with the scroll bar, you can get around and get things done if you have to work on a narrower device. So that's uh, that's one of the improvements. We talked about these improvements in guides. Good. Let's go on to the new administrator administrative in, uh, interface. Um, a very small thing when you do a new API endpoint that uh, it used to say something like new my object. And I'm actually going to do this in the new view. So we will take a look at this. So we're in our new view. We would say new API. And up here at the top, it would say something like new my object. Well, that wasn't very friendly. So it says new API. Very small change, but uh, you know, every, everything gets counted. Oh, six <coughs> This is a uh, potentially breaking change for some of you, but it's uh, it's the right thing to do. We, um, in, in the name of an API, we are now editing the name to be uh, a, a, a good name. And so when, uh, when you create an MP API endpoint and you say ECDF, uh, we don't allow white spaces within that. We also don't allow uh, dashes and other special characters except the underscore. So it's a little bit of a breaking change for some of you that have them, but this is a, um, the, and a uh, uh, our, our product team has, has evaluated it that it, that's the best way going forward to um, make sure that the names that you use are going to be able to be used without issue. Uh, regardless of how you're trying to use them, razor scripts and things like that. So um, that is a uh, enhancement slash bug fix. We talked about the control S already. So uh, skip past that one and the performance. So let's talk about some more. This is uh, starting to uh, deliver on our promise of doing better, uh, pro providing a better developer experience you know, through validation in real time, uh, helping you find your errors. So within automation, as you're, uh, as you're working with things, we're paying attention now to tokens and, that, and how they're created and, and warn if things aren't right. So let's see what that looks like. If we go to our, let me zoom up a little bit here, I guess. If we go to our automation section and we create a new job. We are at a demo job. And we let's say that we do something very typical where we're going to uh, set a few tokens, um, create a PDF, and send an email. So not a hard job, but uh, we will add an action. Um, what action do we want to add? Well, notice as I'm scrolling down the list, here's a small one we've added. This search bar doesn't disappear. It used to scroll off the top, and now it stays sticky. So if you scroll down and you don't see what you're after, you can start searching for it. So I'm looking for a, a token. And so I want to do a create update tokens. There's my action. And what I want to add is the from address. And this is going to be from me. And so that's created a token for us. And then uh, maybe we're going to have the subject as well. So we've got a couple of uh, tokens created. Talking with this one. The next thing we were going to do is uh, create a PDF. So we're going to generate a PDF and we'll fill in some blanks here. So um, Let's say that um, 
we also want to say the um, file name is sample file name PDF. So we're passing this in as a variable. So our autocomplete, as we fill this in, as we start to type a left bracket, it's um, Oh, it's called file name. File name is here on the list. So our, our autocomplete is helping us find our tokens and fill them in. And so we see it here. And um, we're going to output, let's say, an output, output token that is going to be used to attach it to the send email action. So now we'll also uh, do an email action, send email. And so we want to send it, uh, make it be from the uh, from address that we defined above. Notice it's helping us in line here. And we're, I'm just going to send this, put, a, put a, uh, an email address in here just for testing purposes. Um, and our subject is going to be called email subject. Notice it finds it for us. I'll just point out too, if you've used our auto uh, complete information before, um, that previously we were sticking some colons in here, and you had to do some some uh, keyboard or mouse clicks to get away from it. Now it's just very convenient. It acts like you think it ought to act to help fill, help you fill in the blanks. Um, and so now we want to attach from token, and uh, this is the the output. Oops, the output absolute URL that we have here. So I'm going to collapse all and just look at that. We've got parameters. We're generating a PDF. We're sending an email. So um, let's see. We have this flag. That's a nice uh, flag here. It has parameter errors, and if we get down into it, let's see what it's telling us why it doesn't like this. Uh, probably because we didn't give it destination, and I see that it's not highlighting, which is kind of interesting. It would have hoped it would turn red. Um, but let's see if that's the reason that it was whining. Yes. So with that, I'm going to just save my work, and I'm going to use my Control S to do that, so it's uh, saved and we don't lose it. So now remind you why we were here. We are looking at token validation logic actions that uh, what happens if things get removed or renamed or uh, reordered. So uh, if we try and move the send email action up, it's going to tell that it has parameters because it doesn't know about from address or email subject or the absolute URL at this point. If we move it a slightly different spot, it still has errors, but now it, it knows the subject and the from address, but it just doesn't know the token. So this is going to help you um, to put things, <clears throat> if you if you reorder things and you, and you haven't um, taken into consideration the context of all the things that you've created, it's going to help you do that. It's going to help you let you know that there's a problem. And if, for example, you change a, uh, a token name to something else, now this one is showing up that it has errors because it doesn't recognize this email subject. The token doesn't make sense anymore. And uh, so we need to, to fix it. So it's going to help you with consistency. I hope you find that of value. Um, We have a, a story, I'm not going to show it today, but the idea is that if, uh, oh, no, create update token. The, I, I will show this one really quickly. This was just an omission on our part that uh, if you, um, let's do another create update token. And where did that go? Um, 
that token was, was added to the stack in the wrong spot. That's a bug that I'm going to report to development. So now it's added at the right spot at the, at the bottom of the list. And uh, just the, the point is that um, this autocomplete information here, uh, this autocomplete functionality was not activated on the create update tokens prior, and now it is. So we're getting these things to appear in the right places and also um, not appear in the wrong places. So uh, for example, in, in output tokens of, uh, let's, let's do a PDF action. I'm gonna close everything here and go to our PDF action. We have a number of outputs. Notice that when, you, when you're trying to store things to a URL, uh, this is an output token. We don't generate this autocomplete on an output token. That was, if we did that previously, it was an error. You're, you have to come up with your own output value. Uh, so um, we're just getting better at the way that we do all of that. Um, I already mentioned that that search action doesn't scroll out of the way. So you, you don't lose, you don't have to scroll all the way back up to the top if you decide to search for your action by typing. Here's a, here's a, a good one that uh, we can demonstrate pretty easily. We mentioned this the last time that when you try and leave and you haven't saved, you're getting this warning message. Do you really want to leave? Yeah, I want to leave. So that, that hopefully will prevent you from losing work. Um, if we were to if we were to create a long running job, and that's easy to do, you know, select that we want to create a job as its name and as an action, we're going to say that we want to do a flow weight action. And I'm just going to pick for for uh, this is one second. I'm going to change it to fifteen seconds. Uh, nope, let's do five. That's fine. And save and close this. We now have a job that when we click the button, it will run for a long time. Five seconds. Notice that when the job is running, it says running and you won't let you click the button again. This was um, in our previous interface. It, it, uh, it did that. It, um, let you click the button again so you could get multiple uh, multiple instances of the job running at the same time uh, if you if you didn't realize that's what's going on so now we just we just lock it out when the job is active <clears throat> okay um so that's the that's that one we fixed some bugs um we, if you have a new API and if you're trying to give it the same name and the same method, so get or put or uh, post, it won't let you save that. So you can't have two things named the same thing. That's uh, certainly a bug that was fixed. Um, when you're in automation, here's one that um, when you're cloning a job, uh, it, it automatically adds the uh, ID to the URL, and that just is, will save you if you happen to refresh the screen. So what does that look like? We clone this long-running job, and notice that at, at start, we're in the create job mode. It's not actually saving anything, but as soon as we hit save, it now becomes job six, and if you refresh the screen, you're still on job six. Good small bug fixed. Um, we are also starting to do uh, combined parameter validation. So the idea is that um, if you are, uh, when you, there's some things that are, uh, we have to test multiple things. Uh, so for example, in a send email, there is the, uh, the switch. Well, let's just take a look at it. So our demo job here had a send email. One of the other, one, e either you send um, in this action, you either have to provide a to email address or you want to determine the email address automatically. Um, 
end that those common uh, previously we were our, our um, ability to, to check for a required parameter was was based on one thing that being true and now we're looking for a combination it either has to have a uh, to address or you're determining it automatically or you're sending it to all users so we're getting we're getting better at uh, at correctly editing uh, and validating your jobs um there was a question about will the running job limitation uh, be only for manual execution um jobs um we did not change how they were threaded um, so i wouldn't anticipate that there's any change to um if you have multiple activations it's just that we don't let you trigger multiple jobs manually at the same time so it's a it's an interface thing not a not a core thing and that is my understanding so it shouldn't shouldn't break anything. Um, we had an error uh, with date fields, and I'll show you. Let me show you the before version of this. Let's see if I can bring this up. The idea is that uh, if you were looking in the JavaScript console in your browser, when when there was a date field present, you could see an error showing up. The error wasn't blocking you from doing anything it wasn't uh impacting the way the the system ran but uh it, it just shows up as an error and that's kind of ugly so we cleaned it up so here's what it would look like you were looking at the inspect console and let's make it a little bigger here and we were to go do a new thing that has a date field You'd see this error that says invalid date provided and uh, something from flat picker big long looks horrible didn't do anything it didn't impact your ability to use the tool in any way, but now if you have a date field that error won't show up so that's. Uh, a nice uh, small thing that was provided. Okay, but for the last couple of minutes i'm. Um, I think less demonstration more more uh, just running through things um maybe let's see there's we're renaming a uh, one of our templates the bootstrap 3 obsolete so let's take a look at that see i can't help myself if we go into um editing a form on our oops this is our uh 123 system i want to look at yeah our books tab here where we just were if we edit a form and take a look at the templates that you can choose from, we've rearranged here a little bit. So the unit settings, we now have uh, Bootstrap 3, Bootstrap 3 Legacy Engine, and obsolete. And uh, so this uh, this is the one that was previously called Bootstrap Three Obsolete, but uh, in a in a slightly confusing way, we had uh, the Bootstrap Three XSL, which is the legacy engine. We had a, also a Bootstrap Three Razor, so it's the, you know, still Bootstrap Three but running the Razor engine, and then. Now our recommendation use Bootstrap Five, but if you're still using Bootstrap Three, now we have these two different ones to pick from. Uh, Bootstrap Three Legacy Engine Obsolete. We're going to be at some point removing the Legacy Engine, so we're really trying to focus you focus you on the things that you should be using. Um, Bootstrap Five is the preferred. Uh, if you must use Bootstrap Three, if you don't have a Bootstrap five skin yet then bootstrap three is the preferred of the two because uh, at some point we're going to remove the legacy engine um it's an indeterminate date yet but we're just trying to give you the heads up to be moving in the right direction okay um we are removing the old upgrade functionality so when you look at uh, updates. I think I have a 
set upgrade those updates. We used to have an older interface and a newer interface, and you could switch between them. Well, now we only have the new interface. Uh, we, as we, our intention all along has been to leave the old one in place while we get the new one up and stable. And uh, now that it's up and stable, we've removed the old one. So that happens at 125, just to be aware of. We had an older plant and app skin. We have two that we provide up until now. The plant and app skin, which was a menu down the left, and the page builder skin, which is a menu across the top. We are no longer releasing the plant and app skin with new uh, plant and app implementations. And we are, um, you're, you're going to want to move away from the old plant and app skin. It's not going to break your system but uh, uh, immediately, but we are going to be removing support for it and then eventually uninstalling it. So if you are using the plant and app skin, you should pull back from that. And uh, in, this is one that Peter mentioned that in search boost, the XSL uh, templates, there's, they're, being rem they're removed. And so you, when you pick your search input and search output templates, they'll, you'll be choosing from the, uh, the razor templates. Again, we're trying to, to eliminate our use of XSL. Um, I'll just mention known issues. This is a continued known issue, and it's not really uh, so much with our product. But if you're trying to use Too Sexy in combination with our product, the way that uh, Too Sexy installs conflicts with our product, uh, we have a guide of a workaround available. And uh, if you're upgrading a system and um, beyond 120.65 or at 120 and, and beyond, uh, you're going to want to work through any issues with too sexy. Uh, at, uh, you just know that you're going to have issues that need to be resolved. It uh, amounts to editing the web config file and removing those inconsistencies. Okay. So uh, that is not 100%, but that is most of what's part of our 125 release. I hope you found something in there that uh, will be of value to you as you upgrade. And we look forward to having you participate in the beta test. We'll be available to talk about this more on Friday in the Low Code Campfire. And I hope to talk to, uh, talk to you about it then. In any case, a uh, reminder, two weeks from now, we'll be having our next episode of Low Code Cafe. Thanks for joining.